Hello, everyone. This is Mary Lynn Cardell, registered dietitian. Um, thank you so much for joining us um, today. I hope that you can see uh, my uh, webcam. Um, so I'm not sure if you can not see the webcam. If you only see the webcam, maybe you don't see. Um, this is my first time trying to uh, have the webcam and my slides, so I'm not sure if I can do both. So I might have to. Um, I might have to just put the slides up, and then the webcam um, is does not seem to be allowing me to to do both. So I apologize. I was hoping I would be able to do um, both the webcam and um, the slides, but it doesn't look like it's allowing me to do both of those today. So I just want to introduce myself. Um, I am Mary Lynn Cardell, I'm a registered dietitian. And today we're going to talk about baby led weaning, um, help you kind of understand what baby led weaning is, um, understand you know, possibly benefits of it, possible risk of it. And so today is not for me to convince you to, to go one direction or the other. Um, today is to help you or to, is to help you understand uh, what it is and those potential positives and negatives so that you can feel comfortable. Um, if you do have a family that is um, requesting to have a baby led weaning approach, and that way you can feel um, like you understand um, how to help them and support them in your center. Um, we do have, it will be an hour long um, webinar today. And at the end of the webinar, there will be a survey. Uh, it does require you to complete the survey as well as there'll be several poll questions throughout the webinar. Uh, and so we do need you to complete the poll questions as well as the, the completed survey so that we know that you had a participation in today's um, webinar. And then we will be sending out those uh, uh, certificates, uh, usually within 48 hours. If you have not received a certificate from me in the past, it may go to your junk folder, your spam. Uh, and so I would definitely check um, in those folders uh, to see if uh, it's in there before you contact me. So if you haven't received it um, within 48, you know, by 48 hours of the completion of today's webinar, uh, and it's not in one of those other folders, please uh, feel free to give me an email and we can see if we can sort that out. Uh, so uh, if there's any other questions, there is a questions tab. So um, please feel free to ask questions if you have them. Um, I do have a handout. I'll go through the handout today. So the handout um, is something that you might want to download prior to uh, logging off today for the webinar. And that way you will have that as your own resource. So we're going to start with the poll. And, and the poll is just um, trying to find out you know, how familiar are you with baby led weaning. So I'm going to start the poll. So the question is, how familiar are you with baby led weaning? Uh, are you very, very familiar? I encourage this method in my center, somewhat familiar. I have uh, families using this method or I know very little about this uh, style of feeding. So I'll give you just a couple seconds to, to answer and, and give your, um, so we have an idea of kind of where everybody is today and help us to understand how to best um, educate you and, and, and help um, answer any questions maybe that, that you um, may have about what baby led weaning is. So I'll give another you know, 10 or 15 seconds um, so that we can get everybody voting. Okay, do I think we have, yep, there we go, all right. So it looks like um, most of you are know very little about this feeding style, so that's um, great, you know, it helps. Hopefully um, I can help give you that information and let you understand the pros and the cons of it uh, so that you can feel really confident um, if you have a family who does uh, choose to, to go with this feeding style. So we'll kind of start. 
Uh, and so kind of just, you know, helping you understand what is baby led weeding and it's basically an alternative to spoon feeding a baby pureed foods. So the concept is that the child uses their own hands um, in, in doing all the preparation, all the food um, from, from the plate or the, um, the surface to their mouth. Um, that there's no direction by the adult of putting that food in their mouth. And one of the big things is uh, it's really important is that we don't put food in the child's mouth um, because uh, the concept is that that could possibly lead to increased risk of choking. Uh, and so it's kind of that alternative, that traditional method of um, using pureed baby foods in the, in the adult um, the adult is uh, providing that that uh, food. Uh, this is an alternative. It looks like I'm having a little bit of um, internet issues, so I apologize if that's happening on your end. Um, so the idea is uh, that it's very popular in the UK right now. It's very popular in Australia. Um, and so it's gaining a little bit of traction here in the US. And so that's really kind of helping us um, uh, understand it a little bit more because it has been pretty popular in the UK and Australia in the past. Uh, so it's a practice where babies six months or older um, would jump straight to finger foods as their solids are introduced. And so they're bypassing kind of the puree and the mashed up food. So that traditional mashed up puree kind of consistency um, is not provided to the child. It's more of a solid food that they can hand, hold in their hand, but it needs to be soft and squishy. Uh, to reduce that risk of choking. Um, it's called baby led weaning because it's based on that preference. The baby is leading the way um, in, in their, their food choices and how much they eat. Uh, so the, the hope is that it allows a baby to learn to chew or gum uh, their food um, and then swallow it. And so it's thought to be beneficial um, in that babies are in control of how much they put in their mouth. And that's where the concept is, the adult does not put any food in the child's mouth, um, helping them really learn to kind of regulate that intake, the amount of food, and also the bite size. Uh, it's something that because it is, you know, one controversial, and we want to make sure that a child is appropriate for a baby led weaning, um, I would not have any um, child in my center or your center um, without a pediatrician approval in a letter because um, there are, you know, certain risks if a child is not developmentally ready for this type of feeding style. So if you do have a family, a parent who wants to try this, um, it is important that you have a, uh, a pediatrician note and also that you understand kind of the pros and cons so that you can really decide if that's something that you want um, in your center. Uh, so some infants, especially those who may have special needs, um, maybe they don't have um, great hand-eye coordination, maybe they can't hold up their neck. Um, those individuals, those children are not a good candidate for baby led weaning. So um, the, the hope with baby led weaning is that a child who experiences baby led weaning will accept a right, wider variety of foods, uh, that they are in that process of independence and choosing those foods, and that when they're exposed to those, those foods, um, that they will hopefully have a larger variety of foods that they prefer. Uh, they have some research that shows that individuals, who, little infants that start baby led weaning are less picky later in life, um, and so that's kind of the, the concept is that they are able to make those decisions. And so that may impact uh, their kind of quote unquote pickiness. Uh, one of the big things is to help reduce the risk of becoming overweight and obese. Um, and the concept behind this is that we as adults don't really know when a child is full. And so we may eat, um, we may feed that infant um, and we may feed them very quickly, especially if we're in a center that, you know, we're maybe feeding multiple infants at one time. Um, and so, you know, it takes about 15 to 20 minutes for the time food goes in our mouth um, for us to really identify how full we are. And so the idea that we're feeding a baby probably pretty quickly um, and just to kind of get from, from one child to the next or because that the puree food is fairly easy for them uh, to take in the large amounts at one time. 
that children may, um, you know, eat more than what their body is is um, comfortable with or what uh, their fullness is, um, basically because the adult who's feeding them really understands and recognizes uh, when a child is actually full or hungry. Um, it also is thought to help in developing a healthier relationship with food, uh, and that's because those, that child is more in charge of their food choices. Uh, it also helps the child to work on their kind of skills, their hand-eye coordination skills, their pincer grasp, um, their holding, kind of holding and grasping skills. Um, it also allows those infants to, to feed at their own pace, kind of what we were just talking about. Um, and once again, allowing that child to determine themselves when they are full and when they've had enough food versus that adult um, around them who is kind of deciding if, if the child should be full or should not be full based on um, the amount that, that's in a jar or a serving size versus what's based on what the infant uh, is, is comfortable eating. Especially, you know, infants those age aren't able to verbalize that, and so we have to really rely on some of those um, cues that they're giving us. Um, and sometimes when we're feeding those infants fast, we they they can't they don't have time to kind of catch up with their fullness uh, to their um, ability to um, to recognize their fullness. Another concept is that it helps to um, have more natural family meals. The infant is is eating, you know, similar meals to what the the family is eating, so we don't have to have special foods for those infants. Um, and um, it's thought to be less expensive uh, than those store bought foods um, because it, we're just basically we don't have to buy special foods for that baby. That baby is eating what the family is eating, a little bit modified. However, we want to make sure that we're we're making foods that the infant is able to safely consume. Um, so there are, you know, just kind of talk about some research that's out there. I think, I, you know, so once again, my, my role is not to tell you to do this or not do this. My role is to help you educate you so that you can understand and you can make a decision what's best for you and, and what you feel most comfortable with. Uh, so I just wanted to kind of go through some journal articles so that you understand the research behind this uh, because it's something that's fairly new concept. Um, there is a little bit of research, not a ton of research, but I'm going to kind of go through some of the research that's out there on baby leading baby uh, led weaning. Um, and a big con uh, concern is choking. And so that's probably everybody's um, number one concern when they think about baby led weaning. And so they have done a couple of research articles on the risk of choking. So this one was done by the Journal of Pediatrics. Uh, this was called the baby led approach to eating solids and risk of choking. Uh, this was published in October of 2016. Um, so they wanted to determine the impact of baby led weaning um, on infants choking and gagging. And so what they did is they took 206 healthy infants and they put some in what they call a control group, which is gonna be your basic normal feeding uh, mechanism, which is a puree diet with the, the, the adult spoon feeding that, that infant. Um, and then they led, um, they did the other half in what they call the baby led introduction to solids group. Kind of a, it's called baby led weaning, but this is the, the terminology, they call it bliss. Um, and so they had uh, these two different groups. So one was a control of normal, kind of how our traditional uh, kind of progression of, of diet is for an infant. And the other is um, this baby led weaning. Um, and what they found is that in the baby led weaning, um, that they found um, that there was, uh, infants fed themselves the food at the beginning. Um, and then it, um, it was something that they, they wanted to, to evaluate that, that choking risk. And so what they found was that a total of 35% of the infants choked at least once between six and, and eight months of age, but there was no significant uh, differences in the number of choking events between the baby led weaning group and the traditional group. Um, so the, the bliss, which is baby led weaning infants groups, they gagged more frequently at 12 months, but less frequently at eight months than that control group. So we're gonna talk a little bit later in, in, in today's webinar about gagging versus choking, 
which is one of our biggest distinctions that we want to understand if we choose to have a baby led weaning in our centers. So uh, the Bliss group, the, the baby led weaning group, did gag a little bit more, but that's different from choking. But by eight months, that group of, of infants seemed to have developed that mouth strength and understanding of, uh, of how to feed themselves that it decreased significantly um, by eight months. At seven months and 12 months, 52% and 94% of the infants were offered food posing at, as a choking risk during the three-day record with no significant differences between the groups. So what this was saying was the parents provided foods that were high risk choking foods like apples um, during those age groups. And so what they found was that in both groups, the, the traditional as well as infant-led uh, weaning, that it was actually the adults providing foods that were high choking risk that put these kids at more risk than the foods, than, than just the, the feeding method themselves. And so really the education of understanding what are high risk choking foods so that parents do not put their kids at risk for choking, depending on in either using the baby led weaning traditional method. And so really you as a frontline, um, you know, uh, individual between the parents and, um, and, and, and for the infants is helping them recognize what are choking risk um, because uh, some, some parents may not be aware or educated on that. What they also found and the kind of conclusions they, they made was that infants following a baby led weaning approach to feeding it did not let me move that over, sorry. Infants um, following a baby led approach to feeding that includes advice on minimizing choking risks do not appear to be more likely than infants following a more traditional practice, feeding practice to choke. So the choking risk were not any higher in the group that was baby led weaning than it was in the traditional group, as long as the parents or the adults were actually educated on and, and made aware of what kinds of foods are higher risk choking foods. So it was really the education that was the necessary component rather than it really didn't make a difference what type of feeding style. Um, the large number of children in both groups offered foods that choke, prevent a, pose a choking risk is concerning. And so just like, you know, it's a concern I'm sure for all of you um, that there are probably a number of people in your own centers or you know, parents that you have that may be providing foods to their children um, that are potential choking risk. And so helping educate them and, and helping them to understand why those are choking risk. Uh, there's another study, and this was um, a, a study that was done in the Italian Journal of Pediatrics on baby led weaning. It's called a systematic review of the literature. Um, so what they did is they wanted to go through all the literature, um, and this was in May of 2018. And one of the questions they asked was, does baby led weaning increase the risk of choking? So what they did is they did evaluation, they call it a meta-analysis, and they go back and they looked at all the studies that have been done on baby led weaning to see if baby led weaning increased the risk of choking. So those children who uh, were exposed and, and used the baby led, we baby led weaning method, if those individuals choked more. And so um, they do know that choking can easily occur in all infants. Um, they're trying to learn how to move that food around. Um, and so that is a new experience for them. And that's one of the benefits is, you know, when we start doing that solid foods is we want to start developing that awareness, that mouth awareness, um, the muscles in, those, in, their, in their tongue and mouth. Um, and so we do know that because they're not experienced, a choking is a higher risk for infants. Um, at six months, which is when most, you know, it's recommended that uh, infants start uh, having solid foods. Um, not all babies are um, developed um, and have the, the oral skills um, to safely ingest whole foods. They cannot manage that in their mouth and swallow it and, and make sure it goes down the white right pipe. And so those in individuals, that's why it's so important to make sure that the physician, the pediatrician has evaluated these children um, prior to having them start in, in your center, because we wanna make sure that they have that strength, the muscle strength, the head strength, the head, you know, being able to kind of um, hold up their head 
um, and move their head appropriately in order to decrease that risk. Um, so there, um, because there are possible discrepancies between an infant's apparent ability to self-feed and their real capacity to do so. So that's what they kind of found in this study was that if we just look at six months and just look at a parent's desire to do um, an infant led breeding, weaning or um, baby led weaning, it really didn't evaluate what the child's abilities are. Um, and so really that importance of could that be one of the higher risk factors for choking is that we're, we're providing a baby led weaning um, options to children who are just not developmentally ready. Um, but they did found that when there were babies that were developmentally ready and um, using you know, the method of baby led weaning versus those babies who were in a traditional feeding um, atmosphere, um, found no difference in choking incidences between the baby led weaning and their traditional weaning group. So the traditional kind of pureed spoon fed group. Um, in uh, 199 of the baby led weaning infants, 30% had at least one episode of choking with solid food ingestion. Often apples was the most common one that was, was, was um, led choking risk. And so really helping those parents understand that that's probably not the best food for those children to have. Um, it was often um, that uh, the difference also is helping a parent understand and educate them on the difference between choking and gagging. Um, because a lot of this was self-reported, they didn't have these kids 24 seven, they weren't monitoring them. A lot of it was a self-reported. Um, so they do kind of wonder how much was actually gagging versus that choking. Uh, but we, we want to make sure that we uh, are really aware of that choking risk and, and take those precautions. Uh, so um, they had another study that they this meta-analysis kind of evaluated. Um, and they found that the other study had similar results as this last one. Um, in this study, they had 1,151 infants evaluating the choking and, and gagging risk. Um, the results of this study showed at least one episode of choking had occurred um, in uh, about 11.9% of the strip baby led weaning group um, in 15% um, percent of the loose baby led weaning group, meaning they kind of had a little bit of both. They were feeding them solids, but also a little bit of spoon feeding. Um, and in 11.6% of the traditional weaning group. So what that was kind of showing was that in both the traditional, that the, the child solely, and parent doesn't involve, adult isn't involved with their feeding, as well as that traditional, the, the rates 11.9 versus 11.6 were pretty similar. It was when they were kind of going back and forth between a, um, you know, a traditional uh, feeding style and a baby led weaning style that they had a slightly higher incidence of, of choking risk. And that kind of makes sense because what we we're, we're trying to do is help that child understand and have consistency with their eating patterns. And when we do that, they learn how to use that swallow appropriately. And there wasn't any increased risk of, of um, choking. So uh, in another study, um, it was um, by uh, another group and they, found um, that with this study was specifically to identify the risk of choking. Um, they found in this study that there's no differences in choking episodes between either group, the traditional or the baby led weaning. And so uh, they really are, um, you know, it seems uh, that the risk is, is not any higher when that individual is educated and made aware of what foods to, to appropriately uh, provide to that infant. Uh, another question that's that's asked often is, does baby led weaning um, increase risk of inadequate energy intake and growth faltering? That was a question they asked. So it's kind of a complicated uh, way of saying, do, do our infants who are baby led, led baby led weaning, do they get enough nutrition? And so that that was this other study that they did. Um, and so what they did is they evaluated multiple studies, um, and they said that. Um, Baby led weaning children were classified as significantly underweight compared to spoon fed children. Well, that makes sense um, because oftentimes it's going to take longer for that child to eat. Um, they may not get as much in that one short period of time. 
And so they did found, find that those infant led, um, baby led weaning groups, that those kids did consume less calories um, and did result in lower body weights. Um, another uh, study um, showed that baby led weaning um, estimated that um, the parents, that the baby actually had more milk intake. They essentially, what they find is that in, infants who are baby led, um, have baby led weaning tend to be more breastfed babies. Um, and so that the parents reported that those breast, those babies were breastfeeding um, not significantly less than what a traditional child is, um, is, is breastfeeding less as they introduce those solids. Um, and so uh, they're getting less solid foods as their nutrition and still more milk as the majority of their nutrition. Uh, another study um, kind of showed the same thing. Um, and that um, those infants that were baby led weaning also had a little bit more fat and saturated fat than their traditional spoon fed baby. And that's often because the diet of the family may have more saturated fat and fat than your traditional infant formula, infant foods that are, are uh, in either a um, pre jarred, like pre made jars, or if the parent is making their own um, infant uh, foods. Uh, so generally it was a higher fat, especially a higher saturated fat um, diet. And so that might not be, you know, we do know infants need a significant amount of fat in their diet, but that saturated fat probably isn't the way we want to get that. We want to get it more with those monounsaturated fats, which we can get from things like avocados. Um, but if we're um, doing more of a traditional family meal, then we may have more of that saturated fat. Uh, so uh, another study, though, showed that there was no difference in energy intake, that the that baby's weights seemed to be um, pretty similar, as well as their nutritional intake um, between the baby-led feeding group and the, and the control group. Um, and um, none of the babies in the baby-led weaning group had lower body weights or body um, growth. Their growth chart wasn't any different. Um, their weight gain wasn't any different. So that's just another study. So one study showed that there was a, a small difference in lower weights. Another study showed that there was no difference. Um, the discrepancies in results compared to the previous studies may be due to the different study design or the fact that those studies used infants' weights reported by their parents. So the study that was um, that they showed that those baby weights were lower, that the infants weren't in a controlled environment, the parent was just staying and reporting a weight, versus the one that saw no difference in, in weight changes um, in calorie intake. That was more of a traditional um, measurement that was done more in a lab um, or a doctor's office. Uh, so um, they did find that the, the, the individuals who were in more your traditional baby led weaning, um, that those individuals were educated on how to provide appropriate high energy, high density, um, nutritional, you know, rich foods. Um, and so that might have been a factor, whereas the other study, uh, they didn't provide that education. So hopefully that gave you some kind of understanding of the research so that you know, you know, this is where um, I'm giving my information to share with you um, so that, that you can feel like you're really, um, you know, educated to make those decisions. Um, I've got to talk about as Nespers earlier, if you guys have a chance to uh, make sure that we um, sign up for Nespers um, and the Nebraska Early Childhood Professional Records System so that you can uh, keep track of all your hours and also be aware and updated on any um, upcoming um, webinars, education opportunities for you, as well as other opportunities to make your uh, centers uh, the best it can be. Uh, so they do, you know, a baby um, starts the baby led weaning process when they're at least six months. We don't want to start anything before that. We also want to make sure the baby seems interested in your food. Um, so when a baby is maybe reaching for or grabbing food um, off your plates or off, you know, other individuals' plates, um, that's when they're showing that interest. We do want to make sure that baby can support their head, uh, you know, on their own. Um, and we do want to make sure that if the baby is prone to flopping or flipping, can't stand sit up on their own, um, it can really be dangerous. Um, even if they're in a high chair, because they don't have that motor strength and control, that it can really increase that choking risk. So we do want to make sure that that baby is, is strong and able to, 
to have a control over their body. Uh, we do want to make sure that they've lost their tongue thrust, that reflex. Um, so before six months of age, the baby's tongue will thrust forward and push out any foreign objects out of their mouth as a reflex. Um, around six months, that changes. Um, and so once that has changed and they're not pushing everything out, then that self-feeding can happen. But otherwise, they're not going to be able to consume adequate enough nutrition. Um, because Uh, we do want to make sure the baby has a pincer grasp that kind of fine motor skills so um, those fine motor skills um, also are things that help um, you know picking up a cheerio and things are things that will help a child as they get older um, with brushing their teeth writing using a pen or pencil um, and so that really does help what they found is that those kids who do that baby led weaning who are able to grasp and, and at foods and use that pincer grasp at a younger age tend to have better fine motor skills so if you choose or your families choose to do uh, baby led weaning, we want some, you know, some tips for success. Um, and a big thing is we want to create a, a peaceful kind of calming environment. And so we do know that, you know, as a child care center, you're, you're responsible for possibly multiple infants and children at one time. Uh, and so there's always kind of unpredictable possible chaos and, and, and things that are happening. So, you know, sometimes it's not the best environment for a child, especially if they're learning, um, because they get distracted and that can really increase that risk of choking. Um, it is also important that we are kind of one on one with that infant while they're doing the baby led weaning because the choking risk is so high. Um, so we do want to make sure that, you know, if that child is distracted or that you as the adult could possibly be distracted, probably not the best way, um, best place to, to start a baby led weaning. Um, we want to make sure that their, you know, chair is at a safe level so that you can, you know, kind of view um, and have your eyes on them at all times. Uh, so take away those kind of distractions. If you do have a busy house, um, maybe um, putting them against, you know, so that they, they can't see all those, you know, the busyness and see what else is happening. Um, try to make it as calm of an environment as possible. Um, another thing is we really want to make sure we stay on a schedule. Um, and that's because we know that anyone, infants or, or adults, you know, if we're really super hungry, we're going to eat faster. And so that's going to possibly increase that choking risk. So we want to make sure that we're, we're feeding um, those infants on a regular schedule before they get too hungry uh, so that they're not eating very quickly um, and uh, that could increase that choking risk. And once again, got to be with that children, the children um, the entire time. Um, so it looks like maybe there's some a question. Um, let me see. I see someone has their hand raised. I'm not sure if they have a question or just um, if they just we're saying hi. So if you have a question, uh, please type it in the questions area. I just don't see any questions. If you did send one, it did not come through. Um, the other thing that that is uh, kind of a important consideration uh, for baby led weaning, but I also I'm a big uh, proponent of Ellen Satter's division of responsibility in feeding. Um, what we have found is that individuals who um, are children who have been exposed to this type of feeding style tend to have a better relationship with food, tend to be able to manage their, their, their body weight long-term better. Um, and so I really, if you are not familiar with Ellen Satter, um, she has a lot of, uh, I think, amazing books. Um, and her concept, her theories is what we call the, the division of responsibility in feeding. Um, and that is that the adults are responsible for um, certain concepts of, sorry, of uh, the what we eat. You know, you're, you're responsible for the meal planning and, 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 the, and the presentation, uh, the when, the timing of the eating, and the where the baby eats. And the child or the, the, the infant determines how much and whether they will eat. Um, we do know that, you know, children oftentimes go through different, um, you know, growth spurts. Um, they um, may at certain times um, need, need more food. Um, then other days, they may be hungrier than other times, um, depending on if they're teething, depending on if they have ear infections or colds. Um, those children may not want or be as hungry, and then they may kind of make up for it um, other days. And so really helping a child um, be
be able to determine their own hunger and fullness and when you know food choices um, that has been shown to, to help kids develop a more positive relationship with food, but also help them manage their weight long term. And so if you're not familiar, I really do think she has some great books and some resources. She has a whole website with some really great resources if you want to check that out. Uh, so uh, we, it, we understand that baby led weaning may take some time to learn. Um, and so it, it's a very slow process. Um, and so that's something that also um, may frustrate or um, prevent uh, this from happening in your own center. Um, so it's not a quick process. It takes um, quite a bit of time. So it may take, um, you know, 15 to 30 minutes for a child to eat. Um, and it may take um, exposure 10 to 15 times to the baby led weaning process for a child to kind of get, the, get enough food uh, to actually um, nourish themselves. So I think that's one thing, if, you, if you're short on time, if you don't have enough you know, bodies to kind of monitor these um, infants, um, it might not be the best approach for you. Uh, it's quite messy. Um, and so because food can go kind of everywhere, um, especially you know, the young ones, and so you know, having a big bib or um, kind of a smock, or a lot of people just kind of put the baby in a diaper and then kind of just wash them off afterwards. Um, with like a drop cloth underneath of it because a lot of it's going to go on the floor um, kind of on the baby kind of all over so just kind of being aware of the mess um, that we do want to make sure that we're continuing to nurse or bottle fed um, just to make sure that baby's getting enough total nutrition um, we do know that especially a breastfed baby they may not be getting iron fortified um, foods um, a lot of our you know uh, breast milk um, is only iron for you know only has brought about enough iron for you know up to four months ish, um, and that's you know four to six months. So that's when we want to start introducing you know at six months those iron fortified cereals and those iron rich um, meats that are blended and things. And so we do know that those are um, you know not really easy in the baby led weaning, um, and so some of those infants may not get the adequate iron intake because those foods um, we're not going to give them a steak. Um, and we're not going to give them, you know, some some of these ground beefs and stuff like that. And if we're going to give them ground beef, um, it's it's kind of later on in the process. And so, really, kind of understanding that those infants um, may need to be evaluated by, evaluated by their physician to make sure that they have adequate iron intake too. Uh, we do want it to um, cut the food into strips or sticks. Um, we want to slice up the food so that they can hold it. Um, in their in, in their hand, um, and so the idea is that they can hold it in their hand and take bites. A lot of times they'll just kind of gnaw on it and chew it and take off little pieces at one time, rather than just little bite-sized pieces. It's it's that idea that they are determining what size of bite they're going to have, um, and they can suck on it. A lot of times they'll suck on it, kind of um, gum it, um, and that will uh, they'll start kind of eating it that way. Uh, and so we do want to make sure that the sticks are thin, so that there it's not a choking risk, um, and that they can uh, that that the infant can hold it. Uh, start slowly. Um, you know what they find is that maybe you know can be overwhelmed fairly easily. So if we, um, you know, kind of our instinct is to put multiple foods down at one time, um, but what they've shown is that that can be kind of overwhelming to a child, an infant who's just learning. Um, and so really just maybe putting one or two pieces in front of that child um, and, and having them take that opportunity to kind of explore um, just those one or two pieces. Uh, we, you know, obviously because it's gonna be messy, um, you know, I'm sure you've all experienced this with plates and bowls. They're, uh, they tend to not end up uh, in places that we want them to end up. And so, you know, staying away from those is just gonna help um, decrease the um, the frustration um, for most the adults um, and uh, just put that food right on the table and allow and, and give that baby some time um, and not rush them to, to eat at their own pace. Uh, the important thing is that they dine together with the family and uh, and so that you know really keeping an eye out on that child um, but really we do know um, that individuals and in, in children who dine in a family style um, and that's why it's really encouraged for you at your centers to dine in a family style with an adult, that those kids have better language skills, they have higher IQs, they also um, have less risk of, of, 
engaging in, in risky behaviors such as alcohol, drugs, and sexual behavior. So, um, and now it's kind of, you know, seems, you know, like, oh, what a long kind of stretch connection, but they really do find that that family mealtime is so important from infancy all the way up until those teenage years. Uh, we do want to um, enjoy our food. Um, babies obviously learn by playing. And so um, we, and if we're, you know, kind of, we're all busy, um, if we're, you know, a, a type of personality that's kind of always in a rush or always in a hurry, um, maybe a little bit more type A, a little bit more particular, um, it may not be the, the best type of um, a feeding environment um, for, for those individuals. Uh, we don't want to force the issue. Um, and so, uh, you know, let the baby uh, set the pace. Um, we do want to make sure that we're responsive. We're doing still responsive feeding. So if a baby is, is giving an indication that they are hungry, even though it's not mealtime, with those baby led weaning and they, you know, they may not be getting enough, so we may need to feed them more often. We want to make sure we're offering them a variety of foods. Um, we do know that the more we offer, uh, that the higher um, variety that infants will eat long term, uh, getting a better, you know, nutritional source. Um, and so we do want to make sure that we're giving them a lot of variety of those foods. Um, but that's from that repeated exposure rather than at one, all at one time. Um, and so, you know, if, if it's something that your families and you have all decided that it's a good thing, we just want to make sure that we never leave that baby alone. They, we always have them sitting upright. And we also have to watch out for those allergic reactions, um, make, like for any infant. Um, so kind of just uh, minimizing the distractions. I'm gonna send, I have a handout. The handout is talks about 100 foods to have your child start or try by one years old. Um, and they all kind of talk a little bit about, um, it's based on the baby load weaning concept. Uh, and then we're gonna go through the kind of the difference between um, choking and gagging. I wanna make sure we have enough time for that. Uh, so this is in your handout section. Um, it's 100 foods for a baby to try before turning one. Um, and so um, it does kind of talk about how to slice those, way to, to, to add those, like the cilantro, um, maybe put in, the, in like a salsa, um, and um, kale, kind of some ideas that you can make it own pesto or put it in soup or in pasta. Um, so it does kind of give you some ideas on how to, to serve those. Um, but it's, um, we do know that when kids are exposed to more of a variety of foods at a younger age, they tend to manage their weight better and they tend to be less kind of choosy or picky in their, in their food choices. Um, so another really high choking risk is obviously peanut butter and almond butter, all your nut butters. Um, and so we want to make sure that, um, you know, obviously it's a high choking risk for baby led weaning too. Uh, and so we do want to make sure that if you're ever using um, a nut butter, that it's a very, very thin um, smear kind of a, of the nut, nut butter, um, rather than a thicker kind of um, chunky kind of, um, and obviously never a chunky peanut butter, but a really thin smear um, of your peanut butter because uh, that is kind of a choking risk too. So this is in the handout section. Um, and I think it's a, it's a nice little resource. It tells you kind of some ideas to make it a little bit more kid friendly. Um, so other things to kind of keep in mind is we want to make sure that we are um, continuing the breastfeeding. They're not weaned from the breast or the bottle. Um, it's just they're, they're doing their own um, adaptation of, of eating solid foods. So we do want to make sure that baby led weaning does not mean that they stop the breast or formula feeding. Um, and then we want to really make sure that those foods are, um, are soft, that they're really cooked to a point where they're mushy. Um, a baby should be able to, with their own hands, smush that food. Um, so it should be soft enough that the baby can smush it, not just the adult, but the baby can smush it with their own fingers. Um, and um, that it can be, you know, obviously a lot of those things we want to be like a sticker style that they hold in their hand, but things like eggs, um, flaky fish, um, really, really soft shredded meat, um, puff cereals that are really kind of soft and in, 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 um, soaked in milk um, and cooked pasta and things are all good options. We just want to make sure that they're not big chunks, um, that there's their slivers that they can grab with their pincer fingers um, and that they, they can, they're not going to chew it. 
um, they when they hold it, um, it they're, they're oftentimes they're going to move it around their mouth, but they're obviously not going to have the, the mechanics or the teeth to chew it. Uh, we want to prep that food for kind of easy grasping, those long, thin shapes. Um, there's also kind of a coin shape or a crinkle cut. We just want to make sure when we're thinking about those coin shape um, foods that those are now uh, are low risk foods for um, any kind of choking. Um, and so, you know, really just making sure you're aware of that. Uh, the crinkle cut is more because that texture um, helps the, the baby to grasp it and hold it. Uh, we do want to make sure that they're getting, especially those, uh, you know, iron and zinc and protein, uh, which are coming from our our, our meat based or our, our um, you know, meat alternatives too. Um, and so we do want to make sure that we're serving um, those those foods that are high and rich in iron and zinc, which are mainly going to be your meat based um, foods. Um, and once again, it's going to be messy. Uh, so other thing is, you know, make sure the baby's not too tired, not too hungry, um, because we do want them. We don't want a baby falling asleep um, at at um, while they're eating um, because of that that choking risk. And so we do want to make sure that we, you know, I know some kids, you know, they actually fall asleep as they're eating. It really increases that choking risk. So we do want to make sure that we're adapting that time frame uh, for their eating so that they're not so tired, and once again, not overloading them. Um, what we find with that choking kind of gagging reflex is gagging is normal. It, gagging is a very normal reflex. Um, and it's part of early eating. Babies even gag on, on breast milk, right? So that gagging reflex is, is, is normal and it's common. Um, what we they found is that the reaction that a child has is usually to the parent or the adult's reaction. So when an adult around a child kind of uh, maybe highly reacts, overreacts, seems frightened and scared, uh, that baby often takes on that. And then oftentimes that's when that increases that choking. So they may be gagging. And then when they see kind of a frightened or a reaction, a strong reaction from the adult around them, they found that that could increase that choking risk because that baby may grasp, you know, gasp in, um, you know, maybe not pay attention to what's kind of happening in, in their mouth. And so we do want to make sure that you know you as the the adult really kind of um, try to have be as relaxed as possible, and understand that kind of gagging versus um, choking. Um, you know, do you need extra extra time? So at least 10 to 15 minutes, um, really minimum, um, and um, making sure that the baby has had enough. Um, we also know that we obviously we don't want you know forks and and knives and you know sharp things or super hot for foods. Um, so just kind of a cool, kind of slightly warm um, so that they don't, it's not too hot of a temperature. Um, obviously we don't want a lot of spices either. Children don't like a lot of spices. They're sensitive, um, more sensitive to that spicy, both temperature spice and as well as um, kind of a, a heat spice. Um, so uh, we do know that it's, you know, can be, you know, frustrating. Sometimes as, as a child may take a little bit longer, they might not like the food. So making sure that we're not reacting as an adult um, so that a child can kind of develop that healthy relationship with their own feeding style. Um, so that, you know, some people think that there's benefits to this um, and basically that they feel like those babies um, have a higher preference for a variety of foods that those babies um, tend to um, to, to like, um, you know, just choose and like more foods. Um, so they um, also, we know that when babies are exposed to more foods at a younger age, um, especially some of those high allergen foods after six months of age, um, they may have a lower risk of food allergies later in life. And so we do wanna make sure that we are exposing babies to some of those higher risk foods um, and uh, that helps in hopefully decreasing the risk of allergies. You know, years ago, I'm sure you all know this right now, but years ago it used to be, um, you know, we avoid those foods, um, but now they're really showing that we want to expose babies to those foods, um, but never before six months of age. Um, and we want to make sure that we're, we're um, watching for any type of allergic reaction. Uh, they also, is that those infants that are baby led wean are less likely to become overweight or as they grow older. 
Um, and that is the thought behind that is because those babies from a younger age aren't taught um, to just be eating quickly, eating fast um, from that, that spoon, um, that the baby is able to identify when they're full um, and stop when they're full versus when the adult um, feels like the child should be done or the jar is open, left, is finished, or the portion size is gone, which is often how a lot of us will feed an infant. Uh, so it's kind of like breastfeeding, it's better uh, self-regulation, um, and that has been shown uh, to really help a child um, develop a better, healthy relationship with food and manage their weight long-term. Um, it also helps improve manual dexterity, their hand-eye coordination, that pincer grasp, which is really important for things like you know writing and um, brushing their teeth and all those um, skills that are long-term. Um, there is the concept that that chewing motion helps to get your digestive tract moving. And so infants that are um, baby led weaning, that that motion of chewing on the food um, at that young age can actually help the digestive tract. So those infants that are baby led weaning tend to have less GI issues. Um, and so that's something that, that they have found. Okay, um, so we're gonna kind of do a poll of what are the potential benefits of baby led weaning. So I'm going to start this poll. So what are the potential benefits of baby led weaning? I'll give it another 10 seconds. Maybe one more needs to vote. Okay, so the potential benefits of baby led weaning um, are all four of these. Uh, improved weight management, um, those babies tend to manage their weight better. Uh, allows for self-regulation of their intake, improved hand-eye coordination, and improved manual dexterity. So all of those are benefits of baby led weaning. So um, those are all things that have been shown to help. Um, so downsize is, um, it's messy. I'm gonna kind of go through these so that we have enough time to go through the choking versus gagging. Um, we need to pay attention to the iron, which we talked about. So we wanna make sure that we're, you know, those families are, um, are getting their babies checked with uh, their pediatrician on a regular basis to make sure that they have uh, adequate iron stores. Uh, it's more time consuming. It takes time to feel comfortable. So um, if you are a parent or an adult who doesn't like um, things kind of messy, out of control, um, if you're, um, then this might not be uh, the best kind of method for you. Um, and it's, you know, we do wanna make sure that those babies continue with their breastfeeding. Um, so we don't wanna start any kind of feeding before six months, but we also want to continue with ideally with breastfeeding or an iron fortified supplement. Uh, so we do want to make sure that, you know, the World Health Organization says that for, um, we still want to have breast milk or formula at least two to three times a day for a six to eight month old. For a child who's baby led weaning, it may be closer to, to four to six times a day uh, because they're not getting as much nutrition possibly from that. Uh, from their food and so we do want to make sure we're, we're doing more responsive feeding and um, knowing and identifying when a child's symptom or you know they give those signs or signals of hunger. Um, we do know that uh, babies that are exposed to or started to feed uh, solid foods prior to four months of age do have a higher incidence of weight gain, excessive fat um, weight gain um, in both infancy and as those children get, um, get older. Uh, they tend to um, to have a higher body weight and higher fat. So we do really wanna make sure that we're not feeding before six months of age. Um, some parents wanna you know, put maybe uh, infant cereal or something in the bottle or to give that child so they sleep through the night. Um, we really wanna discourage that because we know um, that is not uh, a benefit to that child and it could be possibly detrimental to their long-term health and, and well-being. Um, we do know that when we wait longer than six months to feed solid foods, uh, that those children do have a decline in their fine motor skills 
and they tend to have less food acceptance. And so we do wanna really make sure that by six months of age, we are starting that solid food. Okay, so the choking risk, um, I'm gonna kinda go through this and we can come back to the poll if we have time, um, but I wanna make sure that we, we have this information. One is that in order to decrease the choking risk, um, we do wanna make sure that that child is at least six months of age. They can sit up on their own unassisted. Um, they do not, they no longer have this, the kind of that tongue thrust that's shooting foods out of their mouth. Uh, they show an interest of foods, they're mouthing objects um, and, their, and their enzymes, their stomach has adequate, you know, they don't have any GI issues right now with their stomach. All, you know, most infants have a little bit of GI issues. Um, but we do want to make sure that we have enough digestive enzymes to start breaking down that food. They they have to do a little bit more mechanical and chemical breakdown because it's a solid food. Um, so we want to know that gagging is normal. It's a safety response to food going back too far in their mouth. Um, it's not the same as choking. Choking is always silent. So when a child is gagging, they're making noises. When a child is choking, it's silent. Um, when babies gag, um, they can handle the problem themselves. We just want to stay calm because we don't want to, ch to transition that into that choking. Um, and so as long as they're making noise and they're attempting to get it out on their own, um, then we want to kind of wait and, and, and monitor them closely. Um, and gagging generally eases up. We talked about, you know, after two months that those children had significantly less gagging episodes. Um, choking is when a child is silent. They cannot breathe. Um, they've bitten off more than they can manage, or it was a food that is not, um, they, it was get stuck in their, um, in their throat. And I think, you know, most of those foods, I'm sure you all know, nuts and grapes and hot dogs, um, peanut butter, those types of things. Um, so it's common for babies um, to gag, but when they, their eyes start to water um, and they appear distressed or scared, that is a possible risk of choking and we want to make sure that they can make noise. If they can't make noise, then that is the choking is when they can't make noise. Um, so it's really important as you as the adult not to panic. We want to smile at them as calmly as we can, making sure um, you know that that we're giving the foods that are soft, that there's no lumps that they could possibly struggle with, that they can squish it between their their hands. Um, so that they can actually squish it between their tongue and the roof of their mouth when it's in their mouth. Um, so babies can actually gag on milk. We talked about that earlier. It's that reflex when it's kind of gone down the wrong way, um, but it's different when they, if they, from, from actually blocking the windpipe, which is what choking is. Um, so if they're coughing, if they're trying to move it out, if they're actually you know, in that process of coughing, they're trying to kind of like <clears throat> gag, that's normal, all right? Um, someone said that theirs is frozen on the, what does it say? Frozen on the poles. So hopefully, let's see if I can, is that better? Um, is that better for all of you? Hopefully you guys can see that. Um, yes, okay. So um, hopefully you still were able to kind of understand some of the stuff that we're going through. Um, and that um, the, that difference between that gagging and that choking. Um, so if um, there may be some redness in the face um, it, with gagging um, and it may cause a little bit of discomfort, um, but we just wanna make sure that we never put our fingers in the child's mouth because that has been shown to really help decrease or help push the food more down um, into a child's throat more. We do want to let them try to manage it on their own, but we just want to make sure that we're there and also know that we're not giving them those potential choking foods. Um, so gagging is often mistaken for choking. Um, so you know, obviously choking is life um, is is you know deadly, and so that's when we want to make sure that we're not giving those foods that are potential, um, and that we are um, that we are not overreacting. Um, so uh, we do know that when we react, that that child is more likely to, to look um, frightened and gasp in, and then that is when they're more likely to choke. So really try to be as calm and, 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 and relaxed as you can, watching that child try to move through that gagging. Um, and then if you, they're not able to make noise, if they look in their high, high distress, if their face is turning red, dark, bright red to bluish, then we wanna make sure that we are um, actively 
going through a choking um, kind of protocol uh, to get that out, which is, you know, pounding on the back. We don't ever do a Heimlich remover on an infant. Um, we kind of, you know, hit them on the back of their, um, between their shoulder blades um, and call 911 immediately. So hopefully this gave you all some information and so that you feel a little bit more comfortable with understanding what baby led weaning is, kind of understand those risks and those benefits. Um, I'm gonna end the webinar um, and then what I'm going to do is um, a survey will pop up and please complete that survey. Um, so through the polls and the survey, we'll know that you participated. Uh, if you want to download the handout, please do that before you log out. Uh, it's, I appreciate everybody joining in on us tonight and uh, have a good rest of your week. Thanks so much.